Kom klæk. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for your patience. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you uh, to give me the opportunity to talk to this, uh, I think for all of us, important uh, topic and issue. And uh, first of all, let me offer you a warm welcome. Um, I think that's a, a distinguished gathering. I've heard that uh, you come from uh, more than 15 countries uh, all across uh, Europe. So um, I think this has uh, impact for many countries, uh, the issues you discuss here today and tomorrow. Um, well, we come from different countries, obviously, um, but uh, I think we, we have a lot in common um, in that uh, we all believe uh, in the power of diversity in education. Um, all of you, let me say all of us, um, foster um, freedom of choice. Uh, freedom is um, one of our key values as a political movement. So NEOS, um, I'm the chairman and the parliamentary leader of NEOS. We're a very young party. We entered parliament last year, about uh, 14 months ago. And we have uh, five uh, key values, and one of it is freedom, responsibility. It's the second. Third is uh, sustainability. Fourth is uh, respect, kind of respect, empathy, <coughs> German Weltschätzung. And um, the fourth uh, would be uh, authenticity. And I think these uh, five key values have a lot to do with education. A lot to do with schools, and uh, definitely a lot to do with uh, independent schools that you represent. So all of us um, are convinced that independent schools are crucial promoters of uh, socially responsible and value-based initiative in education. It's uh, socially responsible, socially um, responsive as well, and it's value-based. And I think uh, in this uh, way we share a common uh, vision and a common mission to strengthen uh, the vital role of independent schools in our societies. That's a long way to go for some of our countries, definitely for, for Austria, I'd say. And, um, well, um, I've learned that the, that the main focus is how can independent schools different in their approaches, and each one unique in its essence, uh, how can they find a common path? That's your, your, your theme for these two days. And um, the question is, how can we unite in diversity? And that's what you do for today, for tomorrow, as an association um, of, um, as a European Council of National Associations of Independent Schools. And I strongly believe this is possible, to unite in diversity. It's not so easy to understand for many people. But it's definitely possible. Um, it's, it's a question of mindset, I'd say. Um, I choose this focus, cooperation and competition, parenting, social innovation. Now, this sounds a little bit tricky, a little bit uh, philosophic. Um, but it's not. On the first side, maybe. But not on a second. You will see in a, you will see in a second. Because, uh, in, indeed, schools are about uh, education, and uh, I have my, my keynote speech also uh, provided as a handout afterwards. But I want you to listen, not to read, so... <laughs> okay. Um, um, schools are about education. Um, there is no doubt about that, but... Um, and I will come back to, to, the, to the word education. In, in a minute, because so we should uh, discuss that and define this one. Uh, but however, independent schools are, are not just about education. I'm deeply convinced that, um, that they are also about social innovation. Among other things, they can offer bottom-up social advancement, and they do it every day. Social advancement. Why are they capable of doing so? Because um, they have strong connection to their community, 
and that they are able and capable to quickly respond to new demands of postmodern society. I'd say they are quicker than public schools in the average case, and um, they show a huge impact when doing so. And uh, well, we will have uh, different demands and challenges in, in the societies we represent here. Um, uh, hence, I'd like to go in three steps for my presentation. First, I would like to give an overview about the status quo in Austria. So, what are the challenges for the educational system in Austria in general, and what are the challenges uh, in particular for independent schools, for private schools? Secondly, I would like to briefly outline our vision as a civic movement and as a political party. So, what do we NEOs uh, want to achieve. And thirdly, going from Austria back to the uh, common to the European level, I would like to focus on our common challenge and uh, I'd like to offer five hypotheses to the question what fosters capacity, what fosters diversity, and what fosters innovation in education. Okay, these are the three blocks for the next uh, 20 minutes. And uh, well, we will have uh, some uh, space for discussion afterwards. So, challenges for educational system and for independent schools in Austria. I picked uh, eight of them. Like many other countries um, in Europe, uh, Austrian schools are facing a lot of unsolved problems and challenges. Political uh, wrangling and uh, school bureaucracy are more kind of a hindrance for reform. And innovation, the problems are manifold. And um, the positions of the political parties are stuck in a rut. That's the problem for, for our country. It's a, a, it's a kind of an ideological conflict in a cul-de-sac since uh, three decades. Um, to make uh, matters worse, presently the Austrian school system is defined by a culture of mistrust. It's a culture of mistrust uh, leading to demotivation and not allowing for empowerment of positive players. We do not motivate them. We frustrate them. In general. You will always have some uh, exceptions. The major challenges. Um, number one, Austria has one of the most uh, expensive educational systems, whereas the output is uh, very average at best. So it's a fact um, that high investments does not necessarily assure high quality. That's a problem. Secondly, Austria has a high number of at-risk uh, pupils. We show 20% of our 15-year-old students uh, with partially illiterate status. So 20%, that's quite a huge percentage. Also... Uh, if you compare it internationally. Um, at the same time, we have 90% uh, who are considered at risk in mathematics. Thirdly, too many early school leavers. Uh, that's a problem for Austria. Um, in 2013, we had 7.3% uh, of so-called uh, early school leavers. We refer to uh, this group as uh, those who um, who um, went to compulsory school, or even less, who did not finish compulsory school. And the problem is, early school leavers, if you look into this, um, if you focus into this uh, group of society, um, they account for almost half of the unemployed, unemployed people in Austria. So this leads into unemployment. That's uh, statistical evidence. Um, fourthly, in Austria, education is still socially inherited. So, uh, more than other factors, the level of education achieved by the parents defines the educational development of children. Austria um, shows uh, one of the poorest uh, performances in that regard. Austria and Germany, together. We are at the end of uh, the rankings. Um, Number six, Austria does not sufficiently promote the talents of children with uh, migration background. The talents are ignored. 
they are kind of collected in special schools. They're uh, overrepresented in special schools. They're underrepresented in higher schools. We have many structural rigidities and uh, bureaucratic obstacles. Uh, so the dynamic, constructive, uh, innovative forces are discouraged, demotivated. Um, mostly, uh, these rigidities, uh, obstacles are, are linked to ideological blockages and uh, politically motivated staffing policy. So, for decades, uh, it was a fact uh, that if you want to become a, a headmaster, um, you need uh, party membership, depending on which region. In many regions, it's still a uh, defect. Um, problems just arose that uh, there are not sufficient candidates anymore, regardless of uh, party membership. And uh, finally, independent schools are heavily disadvantaged. So these are some challenges, major challenges. Um, of course, there are also things uh, that uh, work out very well in Austria. So... Um, I'd say that um, our dual system of apprenticeship is uh, a role model for whole, uh, for whole Europe. So we show um, uh, there's no other country that, uh, that would, has, uh, would have uh, less uh, youth unemployment. Uh, that's uh, due to our good uh, system of, uh, uh, of uh, apprenticeship and, and uh, dual education. Uh, there are other things uh, that work out well. No. No doubt about that, and we should foster your strength. But on the other hand, uh, you see with this challenge is that we have uh, a lot to do in Austria. Now, focusing um, for uh, on the independent um, education scene, uh, this is dominated by denominational schools, uh, so schools that would be affiliated to communities of faith and religions in Austria. The state will pay for the employment of teachers for denominational private schools. These are mostly Catholic schools, uh, schools um, um, so they would uh, get uh, funding for their staff. This corresponds to about 80% of their total costs. So that's not bad. It's about the ratio of uh, Denmark, as I learned, for private schools. Non-denominational independent schools, on the other hand, have been struggling to survive for decades in Austria. That's a problem. Um, they receive a legally non-binding funding amounting to approximately 10 to 20 percent of their costs. So there is a huge, huge gap. And uh, I can't explain it as a politician in the year 2014. I can't explain. Not by any key value uh, I would represent, uh, not by any other argument. I can understand it due to history. But we know history we can change. Uh, that's the job for politicians, for the years they're active. Um, well, this support is, is getting smaller, but the student body has been increasing steadily. However, uh, non-denominational independent schools have the same binding educational ob objectives um, as the denominational schools. So it's, it's just not fair. It's, it's stupid. And uh, in fact, uh, this poor strategy... Um, with this poor strategy, Austria systematically weakens um, the constructive forces in, in the school system. It, it systematically weakens constructive forces. And this is <coughs> stupid. It's stupid for, for, for a government, for, for, for a republic, um, uh, for a society. I, I sometimes visit schools, public schools, uh, independent schools, and when I observe independent schools, um, I see that uh, they show heavily innovative concepts. <coughs> they show very committed teachers. <coughs> they show motivated and motivating principles, and they show strongly engaged parents. Um, however, the government says, what well, then, pay for it yourself. So um, it, it does not appreciate these positive aspects. And uh, I'd say that a strength-based, um, a sustainable education policy, of course, should act exactly the opposite way. Exactly the opposite way. It should encourage involvement. It should encourage quality. It should encourage <coughs> innovation. No doubt about that. So what is our NEOS approach? Second part of 
three parts of my keynote. Our vision is that um, talents are our most important resources. They are our most important resources. We don't have gas, oil whatsoever. They are our most important resources. And we want them to, to foster, to being fostered. We want them to, to uh, I call it blossom. They should, uh, they should blossom like a cherry tree in spring, the talents, you know. Only if a, if a, if a cherry tree is blossoming in spring, uh, there is a chance for fruits in summer. And you don't have to ask the blossom, hey, what about you, blossom, will you become a pilot or a professor? No, that's not the point at the age of five, six, ten. Let it blossom and there will be fruit. Destroy the blossom, there will be no fruit. It's as easy as that. That's, that's the story. So... It's the students uh, and their potential and their needs that must be the focus uh, of educational policy and of everyday school life. It's not ideo ideology or whatsoever. It's, it's the student. Take him, take her. That's the focus. Their needs, their talents. And uh, politicians, what is our job? They, we should set the scene. So to say, politics should define the overall learning objectives. The overall objectives. So they should define uh, in a consensus for the overall society. What's the destination we want to go for? That's a political task to, to discuss the destination. Where do we want to go to with our educational system, with our young people? Um, we should set the scene. We should define overall learning objectives. We should define quality frameworks. Uh, we should uh, create a fixed, a reliable, of course, legal foundation with at the same time, allowing for individual freedom in developing educational concepts. And we should, as politicians and as politics, refrain from intervening on the micro level. In Austria, a lot of intervention on a micro level, through politics. But it's about teachers and educators that should act free and responsible. They are experts. Let them do their job. We pay for it as a society. It is my conviction that the extensive autonomy in education paves us the way to focus on students in the first place. So autonomy will pave the way that students are focused. And um, autonomy is also the key to free schools from paternalism of state. I think in education, governments are far too paternalistic. To achieve these goals, autonomy for schools must comprise three pillars, three factors. There is the free choice of pedagogical concepts. There is a full financial responsibility for the schools. And there is free staffing decisions. So this is the threefold autonomy we promote. We suggest, therefore, that funding is provided per student according to the principle of freedom to choose a school without paying school fees. I know that's the fact for some countries in Europe, not for the majority. Um, in our model that we want to execute in Austria, a school receives a fixed per capita rate for every student, regardless if offered by public church or independent ownership. It's a fair chances to whomsoever, as far as quality is okay. In addition, we want to promote fair chances for all students. And uh, that means equality of opportunity. That is not working out at the moment for students uh, with a weak financial background, with a migrant background, and so on. Thus, we want to foster a good social mix. And um, this would mean uh, additional funding for schools with a higher proportion of disadvantaged pupils. This could be Suggested criteria, parents of low education, parents of low income, parents of migrant youth. Of migrant youth. And um, we should also provide additional funding for schools in peripheral, peripheral locations, that means in, in rural areas. Okay, that's our model. Um, in this model, we need a common goal. 
of our school system, or we call it the so-called Mittlere Reife. This common diploma for all middle schools sets the frame for quality. It's also a conception some countries in Europe uh, know. Uh, it sets the frame for quality in the main learning areas such as uh, reading, writing, mathematics, social skills. The diploma, and this is important, should not promote phenomena as learning to the test. I think uh, I, I like standards, learning standards, but do we have to refrain from pushing schools and uh, students to this phenomena? phenomena. Uh, that's not good. It hurts them in their development. Uh, so we should foster an integral, holistic understanding of education. Uh, at the same time, of course, it should be partially nationally standardized with external assessment in order to assure quality and fair chances. But there should also be a strong individual, individual focus for the schools uh, and for the students. <coughs> to summarize, um, there should be a common, clearly defined target for the main learning areas while at the same time extensively offering leeway for schools and pupils to creatively act. And I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that this would trigger a rich educational landscape. A rich landscape with a wide variety of uh, pedagogical and organizational approaches. So, to put it in a nutshell, common goals, common destination, and various ways to this destination. With this multifaceted concept, we are able to comprehensively serve the diversity of talents. It's about the diversity of talents that we have to serve and uh, the diversity of individual needs. It is my conviction that this kind of change is possible in Austria. There are not so many out there who are sure about that. You are. Bea is sure about that. We are sure about that. Um, but the first time I presented this concept about one year ago to the Minister of Education, she said, no, that's utopia. That's out of reach. I said, no, that's not utopia. It's out there. It's living. It's being lived. For example, in the Netherlands. And, um, well, we, we have been promoting this uh, concept uh, and model for sustainable school reform over two years now. Education reform lies in the very heart of our agenda as political party. And uh, we will not rest until it's realized. I will not rest. It's my mission. As long as I'm a politician, I will focus on education. And, um, well, I'm, I'm proud that now um, there will be a fact-finding mission to the Netherlands with all six <coughs> parliamentary pa parties in January next year, and guess, guess what, uh, despite the initial skepticism, uh, this trip and fact-finding mission is hosted by our Ministry of Education. So, she, she wants to study utopia. And I, I think that's good. So, these small steps advance change and we will keep uh, working for even bigger steps to come. So, let me I go to the third block of my keynote. Um, positive development and innovation in education needs appropriate breeding conditions, of course. It needs breeding conditions um, in society and also in politics. Uh, thus, I would like to point out five hypotheses on what I believe is crucial for a positive change in the field of education. So, what are the breeding grounds, breeding conditions for positive change? First, we need a consensus on common basic understanding about education and learning goals. Already mentioned, but it's, it's, it's tremendously important. If you guarantee freedom, if you ask for responsibility, you need a common understanding about the superior goals, about the underlying understanding. So we need a strong political and societal consensus on higher common goals. This agreement is the precondition for more freedom and the more responsibility in education, and it must be achieved on two levels. So this common understanding must be achieved on two levels. Level one, on the fundamental level, we need to agree on a clear common answer to the question, what do we really mean when talking about education? What do we understand when calling for education? This is the baseline from 
which we will frame, or with which we will frame our common endeavors. And uh, uh, I would like to propose a shared vision. At that point, the following: education um, is a lifelong process of human development. Education is extending intellectual, cultural, personal, and social skills. We propose that any experience that has a formative effect on the way one feels, one thinks, and one acts may be considered educational. And education serves the empowerment of the people. Education strengthens the potential in every human being to successfully master one's own life and also to enrich the lives of others. So that's one suggestion for the discussion. Of course, you can elaborate on it. And we will have to do so in the Austrian discussion. On the second level, on the concrete level, we need a societal and political consensus on the learning goals our schools must achieve. As pointed out earlier, education policy has to legally define the framework for quality, and therefore our proposal is the introduction of a so-called mittlere Reife, a final exam and in compulsory school. So first hypothesis, common basic understanding. That's fundamental. Otherwise there is no, there is uh, freedom cannot land. So this consensus is the landing strip for freedom and responsibility. And this landing strip has to be built. Second hypothesis, it's about co-creating spaces for freedom and responsibility. It's about change uh, of attitude by politicians. Politicians need to change their present attitude. What, not all of them, probably, but most of them, I'd say. Uh, they, they have to move away from mistrust and, uh, and ex uh, excessive uh, top-down regimentation. And uh, they have to act as general facilitators, assisting positive change. The task of politics is, in co-creation with uh, stakeholders in the field of education, to define the basic framework offering wide opportunities for schools to succeed. Politics must create spaces in which freedom and responsibility can prosper. We refer to this approach as creating fixed spaces for freedom and responsibility. So to create a fixed space, fixed space is defined by boundaries, um, and within this uh, fixed space there is freedom. The responsibility for solving problems with school or student bodies must lie with the school themselves, and not with the state. And this requires a mindset, a new mindset, and a, a new organizational culture in politics, promoting mutual respect among different players in education. And if this mental and cultural change succeeds, um, I'm convinced ideological gaps can be overcome more easily. Third hypothesis improve professional self-concept and public image of teachers. Um, teachers are one of the most important factors, I'd say we all agree, uh, for successful schools. In some of our countries, in Austria in particular, uh, their professional self-concept is antiquated, and uh, they are not held in high esteem in our society. They used to be held in high esteem. <laughs> Priests, teachers, politicians, all three of them, lost ground. Um, and I think that's a tragedy for all of them. But we are talking about teachers at that stage. And uh, I'm convinced we need to support a new, improved self-concept. And uh, we need to support a, a new public image of the profession of being a teacher. It's an expert's profession. It's an expert's profession. And, and, and people have to understand and also to accept. It's, it's not the fact that due to uh, your own experience as a student, you are an, exper an expert for school at the same level as a teacher. But I think this misconception is promoted widely in our modern or postmodern society. And that's wrong. It's an expert's profession. And we have to give them respect and we have to call for their responsibility as experts. So we need to invest in better recruitment, we need to invest in the differentiated job profiles, we need to invest in up-to-date professional education, and we need to invest in higher
quality in human resources development for this profession. If we do so, this will foster uh, a positive self-concept. This will uh, increase teachers' uh, capability and uh, abilities. This will improve their confidence. This, this will uh, boost their self-esteem. And of course, this will enhance their status in society. It's as easy as that. We only have to do it. So, improve professional, professional self-concept and public image of teacher. Fourth hypothesis. Foster parental responsibility involvement. We have to talk about that. In postmodern society, is there responsibility? Oh yes, there is. I can't think of any other societal model. Um, they have to live their responsibility. Besides positively involving in the educational system, parents are also to be held responsible to convey to their children basic social norms of behavior. That's a precondition for fruitful get-together in school. Um, and this has to include uh, mutual respect, as well as respect for learning and education as basic values for life. And um, I think that's, uh, that's a long way to go for our fragmented societies. Because uh, we have, of course parts uh, of our society where this is not promoted. Learning and education is not promoted as a value in life. But that's uh, one of uh, the baselines uh, for a successful school, day-to-day -day business. Finally, the fifth um, hypothesis um, for fruitful social innovation is uh, the conviction that we have to overcome the duality of competition and cooperation. Um, it's not about duality, it's about a fruitful synchrony. It's happening at the same time. It's not fighting each other. And that's a thing really hard to understand, obviously, for many, many people. And that's a problem for your sector. Um, so we have to promote this notion. In Europe, uh, the word competition has a negative connotation for many people. E especially in Austria, say also in other countries. Competition is evil. Far too often it is understood as the opposite of cooperation. And I think that's a fatal misconception. I'm absolutely sure that as social beings living in a, in a limited life, and your life is limited, as mine, we will be dead one day. Hopefully not today and tomorrow, but we will be dead one day, all of us. So living as social beings in a limited life, and living in a finite world, and this world is finite, so we count billions of stars out there and we just managed to land on one of this uh, whatsoever. So we landed on three of them so far, four, five, not on billions. So we are limited in time and space. But these are two basic conditions of human life. And under these preconditions, cooperation and competition both are always Conditio humana. You cannot choose. It will always be there. The day we abolish death, we can abolish competition. No problem about that. But there is no evolution of life on this planet without competition. There is no evolution. And um, at the same time, and at the same level of importance, there is no social togetherness. There is no society, there is no human mankind without cooperation. There is no human mankind without cooperation. <laughs> so, these two phenomena, cooperation and competition, are human twins. We should hammer 
this message. We should understand them as, a, as the span of human <coughs> vitality. There is no human vitality without this span between cooperation and competition. That's the arch of tension under which human mar mankind is living and marching forward. So this is fueling our vividity. And this is fueling your vividity. And I think that's, at least for me, the most important message for this keynote. Being a father uh, of three kids, I was often asking myself, watching the, uh, toddlers' uh, birthday parties, uh, or watching, uh, observing the interaction of our three daughters, uh, ha have I done something wrong? Have I taught them competition? But um, I've come to the conclusion, no. The kids have inherited this as living beings. It is conditio humana, it's normal, it's given by life. As it is given by life that toddlers will, as a matter of course, and completely naturally, and permanently, switch between cooperation and competition. First they struggle, one minute later they cooperate. Three minutes later they struggle. This is life. I haven't done anything wrong as parents. So competition means contesting for resources. Competition means contesting for prestige. Uh, it means contesting for recognition or for whatsoever. And yes, it may have detrimental effects. I'm absolutely aware about that. It may have detrimental and bad effects. But it is the, the human moral and the human intellectual capacity that enables us to commit competition to common higher goals. And that's the solution. If you commit competition to common higher goals, you will, of course, defend detrimental effects and you will foster the positive effects. So, if we commit our competition in the educational system to the higher common goal of better education in favor of the involved individuals and our society as a whole, we will have positive effects. Sure about that. Um, and I think um, if you look at, at life, uh, each skiing club has to has to manage uh, and uh, to show this capacity to manage and balance the fruitful synchrony of interaction of competition and, and cooperation. It's skin club. There is no skin club, a successful skin club, uh, where you would not have both phenomena at the, at the same time. There would not be any family with both phenomena on, on, at the same time. There would not be a successful um, political party not having both phenomena at the same time. And there would not be a successful independent school. And there would not be an independent school sector without both phenomena at the same time. So let's not tell them it's bad to have competition. Let's foster cooperation and let's uh, look at it as a synchrony. And I'm sure that um, you are an avant-garde in overcoming this duality of competition and cooperation. Um, you live this synergy because you know that there is no freedom of choice without competing alternative options. There is no freedom of choice if you don't have alternative options. And if you have alternative <coughs> options, there is competition. We should hammer this match. Uh, finally, I conclude... I've outlined five ingredients which I favor as beneficial breathing conditions for positive innovation in education. And if you look at these five hypotheses, um, they are much about the shift of mindset. It's about a cultural change in society. It's about the cultural change in politics and in education as well. And I strongly support the understanding that independent schools are avant-garde and crucial promoters of this bottom-up and social responsive innovation in our society. 
The Tao society is developing at rapid pace. Schools shall understand themselves as living organisms. They are living creatures. An organization is a living creature. And schools are living creatures. Dynamically reflecting societal change. That means schools must undergo, like every other living creature, a constant evolution. They shall cooperate with each other and they shall learn from each other. This will automatically lead to adequate innovation and increased confidence of society in the educational systems. Schools are meant to be living and learning organizations, just as students are meant to be learning individuals. And you know this? You know this? You live this in concrete terms, and uh, so it's just uh, left to say keep up the good pace and keep up the good work, work because, um, yeah, you are avant-garde and the rest will follow. That's the plan. <laughs> Looking forward to discuss one or the other statement. Thank you very much. I, I just have um, also our magazine, it's in German. Um, but there is one story, magazine of our parliamentary group, there is one story about Austrian uh, independent schools in there, so for those who read German. And then I have uh, the, our, our program, it's German as well, um, a program on plans for Austria with uh, 10 pages of our education uh, program. And there are also plans for, for a new Euro Europe, uh, it's also German. And, um, you, yeah, we can... I think we can provide this one. This one is in English. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Can I keep one for you? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and you, you were half sleepy when we, uh, Matthias Voss started. I'm sure you, uh, you are awake uh, now. So. I have no idea where you, where you, um, this word you open for, where you want to open uh, with questions, but please feel uh, welcome with any question connected to, to what we uh, here at the New Start Road. Hi, I'm Bruce Schumacher, I'm a first of secondary school in the capital of Utopia. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we agree on the following thing, because I heard your things that were sounded a little contradictory. We believe freedom of the way you educate is really very important. Uh, even within my school, every teacher is free in the way he teaches. And there might may be great differences between two teachers of the same chapter. That's okay, as long as the end is the same, and testing at the end is very important. So we believe very much in the importance of the national exam we have now, which has a high standard and gives a kind of guarantee to have good results at university if you don't drink that too much. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you agree with me? Yeah, I agree. Um, of course, if you grab freedom and if you ask for more responsibility on the spot of the local school, uh, you need to have a quality framework. And you can only assure that by centralized, uh, standardized uh, testing. Otherwise, uh, the province in, in the west of Austria would have a different standard than yeah. the east of Austria. What happens to the Austrian um, compulsory school system? That, that's one of our problems. The uh, compulsory school, Hauptschule, in Freiburg was completely something different than in parts of Vienna. Um, yeah, but I, I only want to, um, to focus um, our, our awareness on the fact that um, that there, there may be some negative aspects with testing, and, and this is the phenomena of teaching to test. So it's, it's, like, uh, it's like eating, 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 and running to the uh, toilet afterwards and puking all the 
things uh, on the game that you uh, were putting in. Uh, so there's nothing in there anymore afterwards. So we need to be very careful. Uh, and I think it's a combination of partially standardized tests, but also part of the test is focusing on the individual human being. His her talents, his her um, uh, aspirations, of, of course. Uh, we need a holistic understanding of education. It's not about numbers uh, uh, and, and uh, that, that they should uh, recall at the 25th of May 2014 and afterwards uh, it has no worth to your life. Well, the quality of the test is very important. Yeah, it's, it's very important, yeah. yeah. You're welcome in Amsterdam. Yeah. <laughs> you have to give me a card. No, uh, yeah? yeah. Uh, we will, uh, maybe you can, I, I don't know whether you're in, involved uh, in, in organizing this trip too. Probably not. Yeah. No. But um, I, I know that the, yeah, the, the minister is, uh, is open to, to suggestions of what to do there and what to visit. So maybe we have a chance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Um, I'm not from Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. So, no, I'm from Denmark, from the German minority, and then head of a very small German school in Denmark. Okay. And I liked your speech very much. I enjoyed it very much. Okay. And um, I thought one point is uh, also very important for us, and that is the parents' role mm -hmm. in our schools. And you pointed out that you wanted to emphasize uh, that work together with parents. How do you do that? How, what are your thoughts about that? Mm. I think in the first place it's a, it's a shift of mindset. Uh, um, you cannot uh, drop the kids at 8 o'clock and mm -hmm. uh, they will find their way back home on mm -hmm. their, themselves. And, and um, this has nothing to do with you as a, as a parent. As a father matter. No, that's that's just not the story. Well, you have a kid, yeah. and you're responsible till the age of 18. And education is probably one of the most important things that happens, hopefully, to your kid. And of course, you have to know. It's like uh, refusing uh, to give them breakfast if you refuse to involve in education. Um, I would not say they have to be there every day, every week. No, but to have to, to have the commitment being involved. And, and carry your responsibility. And the problem <coughs> that we see, not just in Austria, that schools are, have, have to solve lots of problems that are not uh, uh, linked to mathematics, uh, writing, reading, uh, so, but it's about social skills, it's about um, values, it's about respect, yes. and I think you kind of start uh, at the age of six. Mm -hmm. It's too late. Yeah. If you start uh, closing your shirt uh, with the wrong uh, button, <laughs> uh, you'll end up drastically uh, in a tragedy. Uh, I think at that stage uh, we face a lot of problems, and, and we have to talk about that. Uh, it, it's not easy for a for liberal movement, but it, because it's close to moralizing, you know? Mm -hmm. The right-wing populists, yeah. they are talking a lot about this. Yeah. Uh, but I think we have to enter this discussion as a, as a liberal movement as well. Yeah. There is no freedom without responsibility. And there is no responsibility without freedom. These two values are twins. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Michael. I'm from Prague, from Czech Republic. And of course, I have many here questions to you with German <laughs> uh, Also, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I wish we had such a person in Czech Republic just to have a uh, um, ability to, to, to motivate people to program thing. And uh, uh, I tried to do my best in Czech Minister Education to find any person who we invite you to just to have, probably not a minister, but some other person. But uh, but not about it. Uh, not to just. I have one idea. I just would like to ask you. Uh, tell me your reaction to that. Uh, 
I think that we are now facing, not just now, but in the last decade, a problem in, in schools. Because I'm a member of the board, the association, but also a uh, headmaster of two gymnasium. And uh, I, I know the real life of schools. And I think the students now at the moment, I, it's connected with Austria, with the Czech Republic, part of history, we know, following mm. curriculum from Maria Teresa and uh, And uh, I think we should now start to, to have a new discussion with, with ministers of politicians that something's happening in schools, that students are not just sharing so much space with teachers. So they are trying to find new activities, to, they taking schools as a part of their life, one of the activity. Mm. Uh, I think that the teachers are ready, ready to, to, to share their, their their space. And I think it could be good if also politicians will be thinking and just mm. talking about it because we need to to bring something at a, I don't know, more for next for, for near future, not for the future of the third thirty years understand. So I like to ask you if you're thinking also about that way that uh, everything what you said is very inspiring. But you, you, said, you said to us that you also visit our schools. Uh, is, there, is there between years a new political party and uh, uh, wish to talk and to share real life in schools in, in that way where I'm at? I'm not sure if I'm just clear to tell you. Uh, because that's what, what you, because I, 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 sorry, this, you said, of course, our life is limited. <laughs> I've been 50, and I'd like to share the rest of my life with, with not wasting time, I think the world is not wasting time in education. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yep, uh, I agree, but uh, education is uh, lifelong, and it's uh, life-wide, uh, and it's life. So, it would be a misconception to say uh, life starts after school, each day at 4 p.m. or 3 p.m. or finally uh, at the age of 18 or 15. No, um, school is life and we have to change schools as environments, I'm absolutely sure about that. We have to, to change the way we teach uh, and uh, also there, uh, and in fact, the schools are avant-garde, let's say. If you talk to Christoph Korher afterwards, he's uh, active uh, for the Green Party, so the, also other parties have uh, good uh, ideas uh, and, and good initiatives. Um, and he was co-founder, his uh, wife uh, was principal, I think, or is principal of, of this uh, independent school, the Vibes. Yeah. I was there, it's just amazing. You know, there's no classroom anymore. You will not find a classic classroom anymore. They are moving around, <coughs> they are uh, discovering life, and that's education. And that's just great. They could be out there on a, on a ship uh, for uh, three weeks, and sometimes only the, the male students, uh, they would be out there on the field, like in, in communist countries, but none of that was not a bad idea, you know? But you, you're laughing, yeah. <laughs> That's from Romania, yeah, so it's not a good show for you, but uh, I think uh, the, the basic idea at that stage was, was not bad. It's about life education. And probably you can learn a lot more uh, out there on the field uh, uh, than in the classroom. Of course, this perverted as many ideas at that stage. <laughs> So, so several, several arenas for learning nowadays coming from the situation that we understood school was the place where you learned for yeah. your future. Well, we have to realize that and take uh, our yeah. future in that point of view. And that there are several arenas, as you said. Michael, thank you. Yeah. 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 And then right I'm uh, Carlos. I'm from uh, Ethiopia as well. <laughs> There's a lot to do. Um, I'm director of mobile schools, and um, for me, your speech was uh, like um, asking if somebody is against uh, peace, or uh, if, if somebody asks, "Well, we all need oxygen. What, 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 what next? Uh, CO2? Can we live on that?" So I. Um, 
ask myself, what are uh, your opponents uh, saying? What are their arguments? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's so clear what you are saying. <laughs> well, basically they are the majority, so... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it has ever been this way? By change? Um, it's working out well, by change. Uh, every change uh, brings along risk, no doubt about that. And uh, this will not be a perfect work, as uh, the Netherlands is not a perfect educational work. Uh, well, you have challenges uh, your own, I know that. Denmark as well, Finland, and, uh, Sweden. Uh, Sweden, for example, uh, uh, granted, so uh, someone from Sweden here? Um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no, no, no. But uh, they granted a lot of freedom and autonomy, um, and, and, and they, well, more than Austria at least, yeah. Um, but they have the problem that um, they didn't manage the social mix, for example. And that's a huge problem. And this, of course, is a huge problem also in Austria. So if you introduce uh, this model, there are major challenges. How to guarantee the social mix? So this would be one of the arguments of the social democrats. My answer is, hey, guys, for the first time in history in Austria, we define social mix as one of the educational objectives in Austrian law. You should be chopping on this chair and jubilee. But they're not, of course. They um, <laughs> object. Uh, okay. But, uh, um, the, the, the conservatives, they would say, well, we, you know, we have the gymnasium. This is uh, working out very well. Very successful school. Very efficient. Not using a lot of money, but um, showing good results. Yeah, that's true, because they have very homogeneous uh, uh, pupils there. Uh, so they have the, the easiest task. Um, but the trade union of the teachers then, because they're better paid than teachers for the same age group in other schools, they would say, well, not with me, you know. This is, this is evil, this concept, this man, this party. Um, uh, so there are many out there who would have arguments. And it's really a long way to go. You need uh, this shift of mindset takes uh, at least uh, 15 years for a country. The good thing is, and, and I think uh, we are in a discussion with the Minister of, uh, of Education, and, and she understands, um, and, and we agree on the fact that she would never go as far as I would go, or we would go. But we can start the journey, because she agrees that steps into these directions are useful and make sense. So let's start the journey, and I'm sure that we find our way during the journey. And, and this is not the, the patent for all the for, for for solving all the problems we have. I'm sure that there will be deficiencies and, and there will be huge problems, and, and, and sometimes we, we may be wrong with our conceptions because life uh, is happening while you're making plans and concepts. Yes. A few possibilities left for a question before our coffee break. Brad Pell is yes. the list. Uh, hello, I have a from Bulgaria. And uh, I, I think I don't have to repeat, I think we all come from the same utopian land of independent school, which is in itself an initiative of utopian minds. Um, I think you will have to take a lead from the Austrian Parliament because you will be invited all over. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question was connected to what you said, but it was from the positive di direction. Uh, what support do you get? Because we hear ideas like that in, in our country, very um, weak as voices yet. Uh, we would dream of a politician that would say, I would not rest until I see change in education. This sounds utopian for me because I haven't met such a politician before, and I congratulate you for that. Uh, I hope you also stay with this for as long as you, you, you can, re uh, because I've heard a lot of political declarations like that. I hope you, I see that you live with that. So, uh, what support do you get? Where does it come from? And how do you cope with mistrust, which is an underlying level, uh, underlying uh, condition in our society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my question. So we cope with mistrust um, 
by paving our way with a, a non-partisan movement kind of thing. So um, I'm absolutely aware that if it should happen that we are in charge, and this could happen, but it's not the uh, law of nature. Okay, um, you know that uh, in Austria we have a grand coalition for more or less uh, we have a power monopoly by two parties, and they have done most of the things right. So they have done a, a great job because it's a rich country, wealthy. Uh, but we have a we have great history, but we have poor future. So if if you do the ranking for Austria. Um, on uh, 36 indicators on uh, what's the development of uh, what's the performance of the country, an integral view, not just the, the, the uh, not just economy but also family, education, environment, and so on. You will see Austria on, on uh, number seven in the European Union among 28. If you do the the, the half of the indicators uh, looking into the past, you will see Austria on the second place. So we are almost champion of history um, for the last decades. If you do it for the uh, years to come, for the future, you will be on uh, place uh, number 11. So that's the problem for us at the moment. So and, and people feel that there is something changing us, that we are stuck in a rut, that uh, the blockage um, is hindering um, the forthcoming of this uh, country. Uh, so these two parties, uh, have come from 93.3% in 1975 together, over 90%, so they, this country was their possession, kind of, uh, to 50% with the last elections, over four decades. And uh, I think uh, after 70 years of being dominated by these two parties, Austria will come to the, uh, to the stage that we will have a government of three parties. So maybe we you could be in charge of a government in some stage, and of course we would like to grab the Minister for Education, okay, <laughs> that stage. But I'm absolutely sure that um, if you want to don't uh, pack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to One of our supporters is a former uh, chairman of the People's Party, the Conservatives. He voted for us. Uh, and he was quite a, he was, that was quite a surprise for, for the media and uh, also for us, because he, he declared himself after a couple of weeks after the, 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 the elections. Um, but he said to me, uh, listen, stop this uh, waffling around, uh, you would like to be educational minister or whatever, <laughs> because it's a mission impossible. I was minister of education, it's an, and it just, uh, you can't just lose. Yeah. Um, um, he told me this uh, three times, uh, each time we have a breakfast together. I'm like, hey, I'm ready to lose, that's my mission, I want to know that. Um, that's why I'm in politics. Uh, I don't have to do politics. I want to do politics, and I'm ready to lose. Um, you cannot win if you don't fight. Um, but uh, let me end with this. Um, you should not be fully in a fighting mode, because we are a small party, 5%. And the world is turning around with or without us, so, so <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Um, maybe we survive, maybe not. We are the first party since the uh, Second World War. The first newly found party, not in the tradition of older ones, uh, are not uh, taken away from other parties. The first one who would get into parliament uh, within 70 years in the first round. So that's quite impressive. But then we had a, then we had a, a hype. So we entered parliament with 5%. We had a hype up to 13%, 14 in, in polls. And now we're down at 7%, so people started discussing about uh, well, how do we organize the funeral for these snails? <laughs> um, no, we're still there. Uh, we, we are better than one year ago in, in elections. But we have to know, if we want to implement this model, and, and you surely agree, um, there is no way that you could manage as a 5 or 10% party. So you need a national consensus. So what we do is uh, 
organizing under the uh, under the claim talents blossom. We organize a non-partisan civic uh, initiative where we gather alliances, and we will have, um, for example, the third of December, we will have um, an educational fair in the house of the national industry. So they are already partners of us. Also, they are strongly linked to the Conservative Party. And I know that uh, the, the day the invitation is out, um, the General Secretary of the Conservative Party uh, is dialing to the General Secretary of the Federation of Austrian Industries and says, are you fully crazy? <laughs> Opening the doors to this bastard. Yeah? Um, <laughs> okay, but they see that we are doing a good job there, so they they accept uh, alliance. Um, we have uh, 13, 14, 15 initiatives there, so we try to build alliances. Mistrust is all around, and sometimes we are also mistrusting people, so we are part of the game. Um, we need alliance, otherwise this is mission impossible. And with alliances it remains mission impossible, but a little, a little bit less impossible than... Uh, <laughs> So you go step by step, and we don't know where it will lead us to. A lot of things that uh, uh, we are living in in, um, in Booker times. I, I wrote a book about Booker times. Uh, we 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 are living in a volatile, in an uncertain, in a complex and ambivalent time. That's Booker, uh, and that drives us crazy. Some go crazy. Some go into. Uh, Burnout, the others go into cynicism. That's a very favorite option for politicians. Um, and you have to stay in your vitality. It's not easy. It's always a borderline thing. Yeah? <laughs> Sometimes I just fell from the borderline thing. So you just go up there and walk again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias Holz, okay. uh, I dare not look there because uh, I have the yeah. feeling there are more fingers, but they're <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.